Welcome back. Now, we're going to talk about a session which is both a celebration of an extraordinary project which has been running for 44 years and, remarkably, which is still producing results. The project, of course, is the UK PDS. And we have two people here with us who are going to tell us both about its history and about the new results coming out. So welcome to Rory Holman and to Amanda Adler. So Rory, just tell us first, how did this project start and why? Very interesting. I joined the uh, Oxford Diabetes Arena in 1975. When you were a child? I was relatively young. And uh, my interest was in the elevated glucose levels seen in type 2 diabetes, which were largely ignored in those days because people didn't think they were related to complications. So I did some studies in which we normalized fasting glucose with a long-acting insulin or a long-acting sulfonylurea. And we took them to the IDF in India in 1976 and showed you could completely normalize glucose levels. And people said, well, why do you need to do that? It's sort of little value. So with my mentor, Robert Turner, we sat down and we designed the UK Prospective Diabetes Science Study, which set out to understand whether intensive glucose control compared with conventional at the time would be beneficial. Uh, the study took 20 years to complete, published in 1998, and what it showed was really quite dramatic. It showed that the complications, which many people thought were inevitable, probably genetic in origin, could be minimized by good glucose control. And that was a turning point. The guidelines worldwide followed, and from then on, good glucose control, particularly from early on after diagnosis, had become mandatory. It's an extraordinary story. Amanda, take that story on, if you would. What happened next? What other results came out of uh, the study? So in uh, 1997, when the world appreciated that good glycemic control lowered the risk of complications, it didn't just lower your blood sugar. It actually lowered the risk of getting the problems associated with diabetes. The study continued, but the treatment differences weren't maintained. So it was an opportunity to observe what was happening with the people that had previously either been randomized to the intensive control or the more conventional control. And 10 years on, the complication rates remained lower in the group that had, for 10 years, had good glycemic control despite uh, an equalizing of their blood sugars over the 10 years following the end of the trial. So that suggested that it was extremely important to treat early. And the third phase of the trial, or I should say the observational study, is what we presented today. Now tell me about those results. Who wants to, because they're, they're quite remarkable too, like many of your results. Yes, so just to add to what Amanda was saying, um, this was totally unexpected that you'd see continuing benefit once the patients had gone back to usual care and their treatments became identical. And we call this continuing benefit a legacy effect. And the results that were presented today show you that that legacy effect does not diminish over time. In fact, it continues unchanged. So what we believe is happening is that early hyperglycemia is inducing long-term, probably permanent, pathophysiologic changes, which mean that those people are at increased risk of complications and premature death for the rest of their life. And again, to echo what Amanda said, that really makes it crucial that when people are diagnosed they're treated well, and we continue to treat them well. And that's the key message from today. From 2007 to 2021, the data were those that were routinely collected in the NHS, for which we're enormously grateful. And so the participants weren't showing up to study clinics, but we were able to link the people that had participated in the UK PDS with, with their outcomes. And so we have up to the longest participant was followed for 42 years, and there are still 14 people 
alive who are continuing to be followed for over 40 years. This, to our knowledge, is the longest follow-up, uh, of, certainly of a trial in type 2 diabetes, if not possibly any trial. So we also know that to treat diabetes well isn't simply cost-effective. It falls into the rare occurrence of actually being cost-saving. So for publicly funded healthcare systems like the UK, we can't afford not to treat uh, diabetes well, particularly if it's with metformin, which, if you will, costs pennies. So that was another important finding from today. And actually, that was an interesting part of the symposium today, that you included health economics. And I think that, you know, you came into the study originally, didn't you, with a, an eye on health economics? Yes, um, in 1997. When she was just a child. When she was just a child, indeed. <laughs> and uh, the other uh, new aspect of today was having looked at the, the rates of dementia. So this was not originally a standalone endpoint in the UK PDS, but because this group of participants has now aged to the point where they're at risk for dementia, and because of the availability of the administrative data, it seemed worthwhile to look at. And our colleague, Will Whiteley, showed that it, uh, good glycemic control certainly does not worsen dementia, and it, it may improve it. But the point is, because good glycemic control keeps people alive longer, they may stay alive longer to get dementia. So this might have slightly blurred any effect that we would have seen had that not occurred. So your participants, how many were there originally? There were 5,102 who were enrolled, um, and they have been followed right through till this 2021 end date, where approximately 85% have died. So this is almost a lifetime follow-up. There were 53 on average when they entered the trial, um, considerably older now. But I wanted to give you a sense of scale of the impact of that early intensive glucose control. Even now, all these years later, the risk of death is 11% lower and the risk of microvascular complications, what everybody fears, eye, vision, kidney, 25% less. This is really quite an amazing result for what are really quite old and now relatively cheap drugs, the point made by Amanda. But I think I'd just like to say a take-home message. We have been fortunate to, in the last few years, see many new glucose-lowering agents come along, which actually reduce risk directly, as well as lowering glucose. But what we've shown in the UK PDS follow-up is if you don't minimize hyperglycemia from the get-go, then you're always going to be at a higher risk and you're going to need additional treatments. So it seems sense to me that we reinforce the guideline where possible, normalize glucose and keep it there for as long as possible. And if people are at higher risk, then of course other agents can be included. And it also, I suppose, uh, means that it's really important to find those people at a time when a lot of people haven't been presenting themselves for regular checks, to find those people uh, with you know, uh, higher glucose levels in order to treat them effectively from the very start. Amanda? Well, um, we don't currently uh, screen for diabetes globally, but it certainly does suggest that uh, finding diabetes early um, is extremely important. So in the UK, general practitioners, family doctors are asked to do regular screening for a number of health issues. So screening just for glucose is not cost effective. But what they do is they run a panel, they look at lipids, look at blood pressure, they look at HbA1c. And so people are being picked up. And you can see that in the figures because we're seeing diabetes at an earlier and earlier stage. We must almost remember that it's being driven to a great extent by obesity, which is another pandemic. And so we're seeing type 2 diabetes emerge earlier in life. Um, and therefore, people with obesity should also undergo some kind of check. And then we need to think about guidelines for implementing glucose control. The big question is, do you start treating glucose before you reach the threshold for diabetes? Or do you start treating when it's actually above the normal range? Um, and there aren't really any big trials out there doing that at this time.
Well, perhaps there should be EASD membership. Just think about that. It's a remarkable, remarkable study. Um, if you want to know more about it, there's actually a very good book, UK PDS, which you can buy on Amazon. Uh, other booksellers are available, but actually you can get it very easily on Amazon. And it's, I suppose that, you know, it wasn't always well received either, because you've, you know, that we look at it now and we celebrate it now, but actually there were some critics of it in the early stages, weren't there? Uh, there was considerable criticism, firstly giving insulin as a first-line therapy was regarded as heresy because it was normally reserved for the last days of life when nothing else would work. Um, and because the study went on for years, people felt, well, it's going nowhere, why should we keep spending money on it? Um, but being one of the first big multi-center trials, we were breaking new ground. And so there were no pre-existing rules. and. My mentor, Robert Turner, he didn't understand the word no, so he kept writing grant applications and we kept going until we got the results, which now are groundbreaking. I was saying earlier, it was an adaptive study design before that was even fashionable, but it answered so many questions. Well, congratulations to you both and indeed to all the team involved with UKPDS. It's really remarkable and do catch that symposium if you can it's available on EASD TV thank you so much bye for now